All right, we should get started. Uh, the next speaker is uh, my colleague and my dear friend, Thomas Sander, who is Intertrust's data privacy officer. He's one of, uh, at least in, in my world, experts in GDPR and privacy-related issues. Thomas uh, was a research scientist uh, who developed some incredible interest in privacy many, many years ago before privacy became a, an area of computer science. He's done a lot of research and technology development in privacy engineering, privacy science, and more recently, he's become uh, a real expert in how to build platforms around GDPR and GDPR-like infrastructures. Uh, he's also um, a student of ethics and uh, the way data should be used uh, to protect consumer interests across different cultures. So without further ado, Thomas Sander. Thank you, Talal, for the uh, kind introduction. So. The um, title of my talk today is um, Going Mainstream of Privacy by Design. And what, what is privacy by design? So privacy by design, the basic idea is that you want to include privacy consideration when you're creating a new product or starting a new processing activity that involves personal data, that you want to include privacy considerations from the start into the creation of the technology. And it is going mainstream because it has become a requirement in GDPR that organizations do that. And when something goes mainstream, let's say from the academic, from the more um, theoretical, you one needs to make it practical. And that's what this talk is about. So I've been thinking about what could be a basic process B for making privacy by design practical for organizations. And it's a problem I face because I'm a research scientist, but I also have the headset for Intertrust. I run our privacy program, so I need to actually do privacy by design reviews and things like that with our different products. And I've done this over the last year. So first, this has been this concept, this idea has been around for, um, I would almost say, two decades almost. Most famously, Anne Kavukian, a Canadian regulator, created a privacy by design framework based on uh, seven foundational principles. And these seven foundational principles involve statements like um, be uh, proactive, not reactive, in the way you build privacy into products. Um, keep it user-centric. Put the user really at the, at the center of the development and so on. And there's a lot of very good information in there, but unfortunately, it has been criticized as sometimes being a little bit too vague. So again, put on the practitioner set. You go to your engineers and say, you know, hey, what you should do is you should keep it user-centric. They may not know what you mean. So there have been, of course, work both by her and others to make this more concrete. And there's been interesting work done in, a, in an academic world, but very often it is based on building on, you have set yourself some privacy goals and privacy is an ambiguous concept, and then you ask, well, you know, um, you should build better products. But none of this is really required, none of this is really committed to, so you have a number of different frameworks for doing it, but no framework is really common and agreed upon. So, and the, many of these ideas have been vague and not really actionable, and that means it is hard for organizations to understand what they should do. If you're talking to an engineering team, and I've done it a number of times, and if you do it, as a, for example, as a privacy person in your organization, they will have lots of other things to do. So when you tell them they should do something about privacy, they want to know exactly what they need to do and why they need to do it, and then they're going to prioritize it together with their other tasks. Um, so you need to have something concrete, and you need to have also one of the issues is that it's unclear, even if you worked from this old privacy by design frameworks that I like very much in many ways, but it's unclear if you've done it, if you've actually achieved GDPR compliance. If the things that GDPR requires you to do, a number of things, if they've actually been met. So some clarification is obviously needed. Fortunately, there are some efforts going on right now to sort of formalize uh, privacy by design better. So there's just a, an international standards effort that has been started by the um, ISO that's called Consumer Protection Privacy by Design for Consumer Goods and Services. And they have their meeting, their first meeting, I believe, in a few days in London. Then also NIST, the American National Institute for Standards and Technology, 
which has created a very successful cybersecurity framework about four or five years ago, um, is now, has now also decided to do, create a privacy framework. And they had their kickoff meeting also two weeks ago in Austin, where I was present. And it looks like the NIST framework that they're creating is also going to be something that is focused towards being very pragmatic. And for example, one of the good things from their old cybersecurity framework is that they recognize that organizations are very different. The resources that Google can throw at a privacy problem is a lot different than the resources that a small organization can throw at it. And I heard them give talks at some point where they were saying when they were building stuff for GDPR, they put 600 engineers on it, which is, of course, an incredible number. That, but for most organizations, that won't work. So NIST is creating, uh, I think, also a pragmatic framework, which is uh, talk, we'll be talking about maturity levels for different organizations and what they can do. So I should also say that one of the new buzzwords in that privacy community is now privacy engineering. And it's a very rare species. So some of the large organizations now have engineers that are specifically specializing in things that you need for privacy. For example, things such as deletion of data is not simple. In particular, if you're always bringing new services on board and you're creating, uh, uh, you're, uh, you're creating new data, you're collecting new data from your consumers, you want to consistently ensure that data are being deleted and so on. Implementing all of this through a um, smart way of architecting your systems is actually not easy. So privacy engineers. Um, is sort of a new profession that's forming, and um, companies like Google, Facebook, Snap, Uber, and others, they actually have specialized privacy engineering teams. So now the question is, how, what can a practical privacy by design approach look like? And the um, GDPR calls it data protection by design and default. So they call it a, a little differently. And uh, if you look at what the article actually says, is it talks about technical and organizatorial measures that implement the data protection principles that are expressed in GDPR, and also that implement the rights of individuals. So the rights of individuals are rights such as accessing your data. Data protection principles might, for example, things be things such as that you deploy a purpose limitation or data minimization. So when you do this as an organization to implement data protection by design, you're supposed to take into account, when you do this, a state of the art. So you've got to know what technology is out there and what you could be reasonably expected to use, the cost, the nature and scope of processing, and very importantly, the risk to rights and freedoms of natural persons, risks to rights and freedoms of individuals. So when you decide how much you need to invest into your privacy by design efforts, it depends on the risk level of your activity that you're doing. So you need to work hard and systematically determine that risk. Um, and that's sort of interesting, because actually in the NIST meeting, even there were some people who were always complaining, but what about these two or three people who are sitting in a garage, and they're creating a new product, and they want to uh, um, they obviously don't have the resources to do something complicated here and as to do something more involved. But then the argument came back, well, it really depends on the type of data that they're processing. So if they're processing relatively innocuous data, maybe that's not required. But if they are processing um, you know, millions of consumer records, um, potentially with emails and others, then they're in a situation where there's a potentially high risk. Then even a small organization of two or three people in the garage would be expected to pay a lot of attention to what they need to do for something like privacy by design, keeping the data safe and secure. So just being a small organization is not, is not a protection. If they get things wrong, they may get into trouble. So the proposal that I wanted to make here is um, that one goes about this process as follows and to make it as easy a, a, as possible. So for the privacy by design process, you first try to get a very good handle on the risks to the rights and freedoms of an individual. Then in your approach, rather than focusing for the legal um, aspects of privacy and so on, the procedural ones, you focus very much on privacy engineering and technology, privacy by design, and the goals for which you engineer, the concrete goals which you can sort of almost put for yourself into a checklist, is something that you are working towards the GDPR data protection principles in chapter two of GDPR, 
And we're going to see those later and the, and the subject rights in chapter three. And that gives you a number of things to work towards, concrete goals that you can motivate to your engineers why you need it. So I think I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time. So let's look briefly at what some of the um, GDPR principles are that you had, to, and they lend themselves towards practical implementation. So for example, um, 5E on the lower left, it asks for storage limitation. So you should, you should have um, a data retention policy, and you should have technical automated means in the privacy by design process to automatically implement uh, the data deletion uh, policy that you've decided upon. Um, Article 7 here talks about the consent condition, so how you collect consent that is, um, uh, lives up to the high standards of GDPR, and we're going to see that later. There are certain things that you need to do, and this is, again, this is a very well-defined sort of uh, uh, limited, small, well-defined um, engineering task that your, your team can do, even if they're not genuine you know, uh, privacy um, experts who have done this for years how you have to treat special categories of data and so on is also laid out. So these things can be translated into very concrete um, engineering requirements, some of them. So the, the advantage of the approach that I'm suggesting here and that are some similarities, for example, also to a um, PIA approach, privacy impact assessment approach from the French Data Protection Authority, is that the advantage is when you implement this, you can actually argue that you help your organization to meet a number of GDPR requirements in your, for your products. So you have a very clear incentive while you want to do this. You also address high privacy risk for the organization. Just building better privacy, your organization isn't necessarily incentivized to do it. But one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to violate anything that's written in GDPR because that could get you into trouble. In particular, if it's visible to the outside world. So if you're, for example, supposed to provide um, data portability, but you don't, you don't have the technical means to do that, then you know somebody could complain about you to a regulator and that's the way you can get into trouble in addition to having a data breach. So you don't want to do things that get you into trouble in your, in your design process and where you spend your resources, you want to invest there first. Also, it's relatively limited in scope, so you can implement it with the limited resources that most organizations have, not just Small organizations are limited, also large organizations often don't have the specialists or the resources to do it. And for the concrete engineering things that are required, I think you can train your um, engineers that they know how to do it relatively easily. Because another problem for privacy by design is if you go out and say, hey, I want to learn what it is and what I need to do, there isn't any standard training or something you can uh, take uh, a web-based training or to go somewhere and to get a good training in what privacy by design, how it works and what it is. So all this doesn't exist. So we still need to create it. So it's a very simple process and I think it's, I wanted to make it very simple. So I think, um, you know, if you wanted to take this home, if you had to do this in your organization tomorrow, I think with some of these suggestions, you probably could implement this very quickly. What you need to do this is you need to create a review template that allows for a structured data um, protection by design evaluation of your product or your new processing activities that you're starting. And then you're going to have some findings, and then you have to track them and to track the mitigations. I've done it a number of times for our, with our products, and it works um, quite well. So you need this. You need a few forms, a few templates, and you need to have a review team that is competent in doing the review. So for that review team, you should have a privacy expert who understands privacy well. However, engineers, security people can often pull the wool over privacy experts when they don't see the, um, can see the technical thing so well. So you definitely need to have a technologist on the team who understands at least a little bit of privacy, and ideally also a security person so they can spot some obvious security issues. But with such a small team and sort of that kind of uh, those kind of templates, I think you can start a very uh, simple process for your organization. So then you, what you would do is you would look for the, the obvious things. You, first, you want to determine, well, what does your product do? Which product personal data categories are being collected? Then you're going to do, you draw a data flow diagram where you're going to lay out, you know, um, um, which 
where data are stored, which processing activities are applied to the data, whom they're going to be shared with, and so on. So you create a diagram in which you sort of show how data flows through your information system. And then you describe the purposes for which data are supposed to be used. So when you do that, in the beginning, you already have a relatively good description of the, uh, um, of the system you're evaluating. And then I think it is incredibly important, because I do emphasize for simplicity to do some kind of a checkbox approach. But checkbox approach, the big problem with checkbox approaches is that they often miss the difficult stuff. They are good at the simple things that they are addressing, but there may be lots of privacy risks that you might be overlooking because you never, they never showed up. So for, for example, for, um, I mean, there was this fitness app, uh, Strava, that was creating these heat maps of runners where they were running, and you could suddenly then identify where US military bases were in the Middle East. That was a side effect from this published information that probably was hard to foresee. But you could have foreseen it if you would have done a good risk analysis in the beginning, going through all the cases, what could have happened, what could happen. So to do a risk assessment, you can first look at your product, project as a whole, and GDPR asked us to do that. For example, is there um, large-scale processing of data? Are you processing particularly sensitive data? Are there innovative uses of data or new technologies being introduced? So all of those could potentially point to a high-risk activity, and then you need to think extra hard through all the different risks. If you end up being in a normal risk layer, then probably you can go a relatively smooth sailing um, uh, stand, uh, standard procedure forward. But then something else is very important. Let me first say, if it's high risk, then GDPR asks you to do a full data protection impact assessment, but I don't want to talk about that today. But I want to say that just the GDPR high level risk for the product don't, are not enough. What you need to do, for example, that something is large scale processing is perhaps an indicator that your whole processing activity may be high risk. But it doesn't particularly describe the risks to a specific individual that your engineering efforts should help guard against. So what you really need to do, you need to do an additional risk analysis where you're looking at all the possible, we're trying to identify all the possible privacy risks that your project or your processing activity might pose. And one way to do that is there is Daniel Solovo. He has created a taxonomy of privacy, and he looks at a lot of different privacy violations that could happen to users. And it's not just the obvious ones. So if you don't do it in a systematic way, you're probably going to overlook some. Some of the privacy violations are, for example, um, exclusion. That if you target ads towards people, um, that um, there have been uh, experiments done that showed that certain um, ads for lucrative jobs were shown more to male users than to female users. So if somebody knows about you, you're male or female, then you could be discriminated against and not see these ads for these um, lucrative jobs. So those kind of things, this would be an example of exclusion, where so information about you could be used in a way to exclude, exclude you from certain benefits. So you'll want to look also for all of these non-obvious risks, in a, um, addition to risks like surveillance and um, uh, disclosure and blackmail and all the other things that could happen if bad things are done with personal information. I think this is really the key. So you can do a checkbox approach, which is what engineers want. But uh, in, in order to capture the, the, the red flags that could really trip you up, you have to become an expert. And I think this is really important at, um, uh, at risk assessment and threat analysis for um, privacy-related risks. And that's gonna, uh, and then if you find them, if there is something of high risk, then of course you need to work harder, perhaps outside of the checklist, on how you're going to address them. Other than that, then you go back to the standard stuff, the checklist stuff. You know, is there a, um, is a user properly informed? Transparency requirement. Is a user properly informed about the privacy practices um, of the product and where is it happening if you're building an app or, or a website or whatever, where is the user informed? Those are all things you can then check pretty systematically. Um, oh, this shouldn't be content, it should be um, consent. Um, there are two aspects to consent. GDPR makes high requirements, what consent needs to look like. So there's an aspect from the front end, from the UI, and there are certain UX design patterns that you can use, how you should present these consent choices to a user. And in the sense of that, you should have, can have this simple um, 
engineering guidelines for people. There are maybe 20 design patterns or something that one can give to engineers and that they can follow as they create the UI where they're collecting consent. There's also a back-end aspect to this because GDPR requires you to, um, to also to prove that you have consent. So in many cases, you actually want to store what a user specifically consented to, when he consented to it, um, what privacy policy applied at the time, and so on. So that's also information you need to store at the back end. So these two things, but they're relatively um, confined, relatively limited, what you can do. And then during the review, you can either see that people have done it right, your product team, or if not, you're going to suggest to them how they might accomplish this. There's also the good thing is, um, I told you there are design patterns, what you should do. There are also um, dark patterns, UX dark patterns that you should avoid. And the Norwegian Consumer Council has uh, created a very interesting uh, study called Deceived by Design, where they looked at Google, Facebook, and I believe uh, Microsoft, in, in how they were presenting privacy choices to users. And they identified a lot of dark patterns where it seems like you're presenting a choice to the user, but what you're, actually user, what you're actually doing is to manipulate the user into going down a path which is less privacy friendly. So for example, here this is about uh, turning on face recognition on Facebook, and you have like a nice blue button which just says accept and continue, so you can go on with whatever you wanted to do. If you want to challenge it, you can click on manage data settings, but if you do that, you have to click two or three more layers down before you can actually can come to a menu where you can then make choices to turn face recognition off. So although in theory it looks like Facebook gives you a choice, in practice they don't. In practice they've selected a certain choice to you that most users are going to do with. So there is also a catalog of these dark patterns that you should avoid in your UX design if you want to be ethical in doing it. So the next thing that the um, review should uh, check for is that you implement the data subject rights, the famous ones, for example, the right of access, or the right that you can uh, rectify um, records, or um, the right to data portability. And for that, I think you need to, um, you can verify how your product is going to implement this, or suggest a way how to do it if, if the engineers haven't thought of it yet. And what has become clear is that um, data subject access has become a real pain point for organizations. Because if you have a few or maybe a few tens of subject access requests to handle per month, you might be able to do that manually. But if it becomes a few hundreds, then obviously that becomes impossible to do. So um, there is really a great need for um, automated solutions and platforms and portals where users can, in a self-service way, log on and see the information you have about them. So that is, I think, uh, um, one area. And, and, um, and a number of companies have done this where you can really, where engineering can help to make life a lot easier for your privacy and your legal team in your organization. Um, one probably needs this. There are, two, there are now already third-party apps out there that assist users that facilitate asking for data from companies. So here you can click, um, once you signed up with them, you can click and ask uh, them to send the request for you to a number of companies, to Airbnb, um, Netflix, and a number of other companies um, that they give you, that the companies show you the data they have about you. The nice thing is, usually in America, we're a little bit behind. We don't get all the good privacy rights that Europeans get. But the nice thing is that now we have the um, California Consumer Protection Act, which is going to come into force in January 2020. And uh, California, as some of you may or may not know, is the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, and uh, this, uh, this uh, new legislation also grants Californians the right of their access to their data. So this is going to create a huge uh, uh, implementation of this technology and stuff also for um, uh, Americans. OK, the next thing from an engineering perspective, you need to look at data portability. So let's say you're in an IoT scenario. Um, you, are, you, are, you are an organization that collects um, data points from sensors in your home, smart home, let's say. Um, 
then you need to decide if you design such a system, you need to decide which information do you make available to users to take with them. And probably you want to, uh, I think I've discussed this with people in the IoT world, and they think it's probably a good idea to give people all the data points here I've collected. So when you want to do that, you can build into engineer into your system a way to make this data available in, in a CSV format or XML format or JSON or some other and give it to users. And that probably helps you to meet those requirements. There are possibilities to make the user experience a lot better. There are some Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Twitter have created the data transfer project. And that allows a user actually to initiate the um, transfer that a user can move data from one organization um, uh, uh, to another, from one participating organization to another easily. So I've gotten the um, sign that I have to end. So data minimization in a few minutes. So data minimization, just quickly, that's where you're going to uh, check if you can deploy pseudonymization techniques, data aggregation, data masking, all these good things that you may know from the research literature. So they, they, you should see how you can improve your system by using them, make the privacy better. And importantly, always with engineers, you need to verify later that what they told you, they would do that you've actually done it. And after that, it's complete. OK. So in an, um, this works well in waterfall, in an agile process. I would suggest you to actually train up a privacy expert whom you embed into the agile development teams to do all these sprints, because it's consistently changing what, this, uh, uh, um, what is being built, and the requirements are consistently changing. And that means that privacy risks could show up at any particular time. So you want to train up privacy engineers and champions in your organization. And they then hopefully are going to flag up some risks. And then you can, for example, uh, conduct regular, let's say, every three months a review. Accountability. Um, I believe if you follow the process that I just outlined, have all this documentation, that can also serve as a report. So if a regulator came in and asked, show me something about your privacy by design process, you show them that documentation, you're good. If an outside customer comes to you and asks you, and it had happened to me that they were saying, oh, does InterTrust actually do privacy by design? I say, yes. And then they say, yeah, I believe you, but show me evidence. And the evidence that I would then give to them is that I share with them the templates, the templates that are created and the process, but not the information, the content of the assessment. And that has been accepted so far by some of the uh, companies I worked with. So that seems to be a workable suggestion. OK, so in summary, I proposed in this presentation a very simple, basic, down-to-earth approach that one can take to implement uh, data protection by design in your organization that meets GDPR requirements, helps you to do that, works in most standard scenarios. It has some concrete ideas for how you could train your privacy engineers in your own organization, so you're creating your own. And the future work is, um, for me, certainly to refine the methodology, so I not claim it's, it's, it's that uh, um, that it covers all the cases and so on. So a lot of more work needs to be done. And uh, to add design patterns, concrete design patterns, more use cases, templates, and resources, and then hopefully make it available also to the, to the larger community. So um, that's it. Thank you.